Issue 63. We start out seeing the Devil's Gulag being told that the temperature of its ocean is 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, so that's where Mammoth Mogul's lackey sweat. Flying Frog was in here the whole time. So we see the prisoners running rampant in the prison, which was all started by Snively dropping a nail file, remember? But this scene is made pointless as we immediately cut to the force field protected Sandblast City with nothing happening in it. Sonic finally starts acting like I'd expect from him being a warship, as he compliments the people to Tails on getting chili dogs being weighted hand and foot. Tails then waits our time with a pointless recap, and Sonic tells some ladies fawning over him that were way too tall for him to let Tails talk to him alone. As I expected, the two of them argue, while Jack Rabbit and the others prove that they were indeed planning on having Sonic stay in the city forever. Again, I completely understand why they think this is the right thing to do. They could use his talents here. They're just not being considered to the person they supposedly admire so much. I doubt Sally would approve of this. We cut back to Snively, and despite them giving us every indication that all the prisoners hated him, Drago tells him that he's going to be their leader from now on. When I thought they were going to beat him up. You know, for being the assistant to Robotnik, the most hated man on the planet. I know these guys are criminals, but you'd think they'd still hate anyone associated with Robotnik just as much as anyone else did. Their lives were just as ruined as everyone else's. Drago was willing to work with him for power earlier, but the rest? Not to mention Drago and the others were all making fun of him. This is very arbitrary. Oh, and Fang's here too. It looks like they were smart enough to put him in better prison, but not smart enough to just execute him and save food and water. Then we get another completely out of nowhere swerve where Sonic suddenly agrees with Tails and wants to escape from the city while talking as if he just now figured out they'd become prisoners and Tails never told him about it. It was so confusing that I wonder if this was actually a fake Sonic meant to trick Tails while the real Sonic stays there, which would have been an interesting plot twist. He explains that he had to act like he wanted to stay so the Sandblasters wouldn't suspect anything. Why didn't he leave last night then? And he complains about being sick of chili dogs but he could have just started asking for something else to eat. Unfortunately, through a die ball sex machina, it just so happens that all of Jack's group are standing right in front of their bedroom door, despite the time of night that it is. Jack says that there's no way Sonic's getting through the city's force field bubble. Sonic does a smart thing and leaves with his super speed, complaining that they all seem too friendly to be friends, and Jack orders his men to get him and Tails without harming them. Yeah, good luck with that. Especially since Sonic can run at the speed of sound, and it can just carry Tails to avoid having to slow down for him. Oh, never mind, Sonic orders Tails to split up and get the biplane started, while he will find a way to deactivate the force field alone despite not knowing where it's generated from. He could have just carried Tails with him running at Sonic's speed to the biplane, but he didn't have to endanger Tails who can't run as fast as him. Sonic gets faced with some people with weapons, including a sharp weapon, so much for not hurting him. Of course, he leaves them all in the dust. Tails pulls the blanket tarp away from his biplane and drops on some people opposing him from above. I love all the different ways he's getting to take advantage of being able to fly in this comic. Meanwhile, Sonic figures out that the force field generator might be in the Sonic statue, because the most important aspect of the city is it's a protected force field, and so it only makes sense that his controls would be in the most important spot of the city. I like how Sonic thinks that he'll hate himself for spin dashing through his own statue. It shows that they remember how confident he's supposed to be. Still, I wasn't expecting him to destroy the statue. I was expecting that the statue would be hollow and he could just go into it and press a button to deactivate the force field. But instead, he wrecked an entire city's security system and left them vulnerable to robot attacks while they would be trying to fix it. Well, don't get in Sonic's way. He'll mess you up. He'll take your whole city down. I don't blame Jack for being angry at Sonic here, especially the robots instantly attack a city full of innocent people. You know, Sonic, you could've at least spin dash through all those robots in a blue blur in three seconds before leaving the city. They finally remember that Tails can fly the plane, and Tails saves Sonic as he's beginning to lose all hope. I feel sorry for Sonic here. It's too bad. They liked me. They really, really liked me. And when Tails says naively like an idiot, we can still go back and... Reality sets in and Sonic says sadly, just fly the plane, Tails. Just fly the plane. At least he's letting Tails fly this time. But yeah, I wonder how Sally and the King are going to react to this. And the story ends with all the prisoners escaping the Devil's Gulag with an airship and heading straight for Mobotopolis. 
Well, it's not fair to protect it. Uh-oh. In the next story, Sally thinks to herself about how every time she needs to see Jeffrey, he disappears. Unfortunately, one of Jeffrey's men gets in her way and lies to her face. Despite the fact that she's a fucking princess. I love how she lampshades it too. Unauthorized? Since when am I considered unauthorized? After this treasonous soldier tells Sally that he's on a routine walk to the park, it's immediately revealed that he was arbitrarily lying to her as Jeffrey and his elites were running through an obstacle course for training. How hard would it have been to just tell her that? It looks like Hetty's hacking into one of Robotnik's old places, with the chameleon guy saying smugly that the sensors were disabled. Is this really one of Robotnik's old buildings? Or is this just being used for a training room? I mean, I thought those places were off limits, although I guess they wouldn't be to these people. To find out that the elevator's at the bottom, so one of them sends a rope or wire down for all of them to climb down, including Hetty who doesn't break the wire from his weight. And Jeffrey advises his friends to keep it down until they scope out the territory. Then they knock out a robot, with one of them saying they need to make it back to home base with the enemy, placing him on a cart. After Jeffrey playfully tells her she that her complaining that all men don't pay attention isn't very PC of her, Sally finally manages to find him, somehow, because I guess she tortured that guy for information. I love her lines here. Let's can the charm, Mr. St. John. You have a lot of explaining to do. I'm fully in agreement with her, even though I don't really understand. I mean, sure, he's completely unjustified in having himself and his men hide stuff from the princess as if they were being traitors behind her back, but Sally hides stuff from her own friends all the time. You'd think she would understand it. It is nice to see that come back to bite her. Karma aside, I do agree with her being suspicious here. Then Jeffrey tells her that he gets his orders from the king, and somehow Sally's surprised by this and utterly blown away. Like, what? I guess she's not used to her not being the only authority figure around yet. So you'd think the king had gotten over his power-hungry I make all the decisions now phase after it's just stopped possessing him. This does get explained though. The first story was written by Carl Bullers and involved Sonic and Tails escaping from the Sandblast City that naturally wanted them to stay there forever. But my problem with it is that it solved the problem of Sonic and Tails disagreeing way too easily by inexplicably having Sonic reveal that he agreed with Tails all along. Then why he waited till now to try to escape them? The story arc feels rushed. I thought they'd stay here and develop the city more, but instead, after the two run into Jack right in front of the roof at an ungodly hour of the night, we had this tragic situation where the city just wanted Sonic to stay and help them with the robot threat, but because they ran into him at the wrong time, he ended up destroying their security system and putting an entire city of innocent people in danger. What if those people died? What if people died or got hurt or roboticized because of him? And all because of Jack's good intentions. I don't know who to blame here, Sonic or Jack? If only Sonic hadn't already been involved with tracking down his Nagas. If only they had found the Sand Blaster City later. All this could have been avoided, but instead Sonic has to make a villain out of himself to some of the only people who really respected him. And Snively being made the leader of the prisoners felt very arbitrary. You think it'd be every man for himself. I hope Mobotropolis would be okay and not depressingly get destroyed or something. And the second story was written by Ken Penders, and is a short story of a pointless feeling training session with Jeffrey and his elites, where Sally's naturally pretty pissed at her authority as a princess being snubbed in favor of her father's, after all that time of being the only one in charge. And because she's actually a good leader, being a smart person with strong morals, I'm fully on her side with this one, instead of rolling my eyes. Although considering that it's the king who's in charge and not her, and she's in danger of her rights to royalty being revoked because she won't marry Antoine, it does make sense for the king to think he has the right to usurp her authority. I can't wait to find out how all these plot points get concluded. Unfortunately, we won't find that out for some time. Because next up, we're finally returning to the Knuckles comic, from issues 13 to 18. I say finally because it's becoming increasingly obvious that the main comic has entered a dark age of bad writing and the Knuckles comic is the biggest source of good quality in the comic series at this point in time. It's the only thing consistently great. Although I wish the world building was a little more spread out instead of just being about echidnas, but it's alleviated by the main comic doing some world building of its own, so I guess the Knuckles comic has some room to focus on the echidnas. 